We've discussed how you diagnose multiple sclerosis. When someone comes to see you where multiple sclerosis is something you're considering, what other diagnoses are you considering? Of course, this is where the skill of a neurologist comes in because there are actually potentially dozens and dozens of other neurological conditions that could in some way or other mimic multiple sclerosis. So the neurologist has to very, take a very careful history, do an examination, and put the information together along with the MRI. And in a lot of patients that I see with MS, the story is very straightforward and very little other workup needs to be done. So if a person comes in with clear-cut um, attacks that are very characteristic of MS, they don't have any other underlying diseases, they're, they're otherwise healthy, their brain and spinal cord MRIs are absolutely typical for MS, then I usually don't entertain other diagnoses and don't need to do a, a, a lot of other workup. However, there are some other conditions that can mimic MS that require other workup. So there are other kinds of inflammatory or infectious diseases that occasionally can mimic MS. So, uh, for example, Lyme disease, which is fairly common in the northeastern United States is something that patients often come in with, uh, come in thinking maybe they have. And uh, Lyme is a disease borne by ticks, and Lyme disease can affect the nervous system, but it almost always causes other manifestations, usually a skin rash mo most typically, and that's a, a condition that's easily ruled out by proper blood tests. There's another inflammatory condition that's fairly uncommon called sarcoidosis, and sarcoidosis is a disease that affects the nervous system in about 10% of cases, but most of the time, in 90% of cases, there are other systemic manifestations, lungs, swollen lymph nodes, other organ, other organ involvement. In the old days, syphilis used to be a, a common masquerader for MS. Then there, in some patients, particularly those who present with um, worsening gait and have what we refer to as spasticity along with weakness in their legs, uh, a different set of differential diagnostic possibilities arise. One, one thing that we fairly commonly look for is vitamin B12 deficiency because vitamin B12 can cause a combination of motor weakness in the legs and sensory, and sensory changes in the limbs, which are common manifestations of multiple sclerosis. If, particularly if MS occurs somewhat later and again with a more progressive problem with gait, then compression of the spinal cord often from degenerative changes in the neck comes, comes, into, comes into play. Um, and that's usually readily ruled out by uh, an imaging study of the cervical spine of, of the neck, but sometimes uh, it can be a, a little bit tricky. Also, there are some people with hereditary diseases of the spinal cord that will present with a gradually worsening gait problem or spasticity in the legs. Those people, however, were very seldom have white spots in the brain the way we see them with, with MS. There's also a, a group of other rheumatological disorders, um, such as um, lupus and a disease called Sjogren's, which are multi-organ diseases that can have nervous system involvement. So um, a lot of docs will routinely screen for these uh, these illnesses. That's something that I don't routinely screen for because uh, sometimes they have abnormal antibodies in the blood, but people with MS can have low levels of those antibodies and they don't have those particular diseases. When patients actually have a disorder like lupus or Sjogren's syndrome, they almost always have involvement of other organs to, to lead us to suspect that. Some of our colleagues will say, well, I always get a standard set of blood tests after I see someone and have the MRI, uh, and, and you don't, you said that. So, so uh, how do you tell the patient, how do you explain to them that there really is no need to do that? They come in with these funny symptoms that they've looked up. So I, I actually routinely go through the process with a patient of how a diagnosis is made, what we need in terms of criteria to, to satisfy the, the, the diagnostic scheme, and if they are straightforward and there's nothing else that this looks like, I tell them why I'm not obtaining other tests. And you're right that there are certain of my colleagues who, who routinely order much more extensive uh, 
test battery than I do in a typical case. And the reason I don't think that's the, the way to go is because, number one, that adds an enormous extra expense to the workup. And perhaps even more importantly from a medical standpoint, often it produces abnormalities that results in our chasing our tail looking for other signs of, of the disease. Now having said that, I want to emphasize that I have a very, very low threshold for ordering other tests if there's, if there's something that seems a little bit fishy. That's when we, we go hunting for things. The same thing with a spinal tap. You know, in a very straightforward case, the spinal fluid doesn't add anything of value to our diagnostic scheme. But if the picture is a little bit fuzzy, if we want some additional corroborative evidence, then a, finding a positive spinal fluid is important. Again, perhaps as many as 30% or even more of people early in the early stages of MS will have normal spinal fluid, and it doesn't mean that they don't have MS. So, so there's no single symptom or finding on the exam or finding on the MRI that says this is MS, right? This is a synthesis of what you've put together from taking the history and the examination, the MRI, and the other tests you order. Sometimes it turns out over time it's not MS. How do you keep an open mind? So I think uh, it makes sense for the neurologist always to be questioning. And I, I find myself doing this sometimes with, with patients who are doing extremely well. And I'm, periodically I revisit their, their story. I, I said, did I make a mistake? What, did this person really have MS? And almost always I find that the story was quite convincing, the abnormalities were there, and this is just a person who's been doing very well. But there are certainly occasions where a patient has met all of the criteria for MS. And by the way, one thing to emphasize is that no matter what diagnostic scheme one uses, and there have been many over the years, they always end with the final caveat that there be no better clinical explanation for the, for the symptom. But sometimes we satisfy all those criteria, we diagnose MS, and then something happens later on, and we need to revisit that. So we always need to keep an open mind. 